السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله ما شاء الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير ربي شرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وهل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي جعل الحمد مفتاحا لذكره وسببا للمزيد من فضله ودليلا على آلائه وعظمته ثم الصلاة والسلام وتحيته والإكرام على النبي الأمي المكي المدني الهاشمي الذي سمي في السماوات بأحمد وفي الأراضين بأبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين روحي ورواه العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ورحمة الله على محبيهم ومواليهم وشيعتهم أجمعين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم العنين أما بعد All praise you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who is Ahman and the one who is Ahim the one that has given us opportunity to once again sit in the remembrance of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. As we approach the day of Arba'in, it's a time for us to take stock of this Muharram that has passed us by, these ayyam e but what is it that I've changed in my life from the previous years? Or am I exactly the same as I was when Muharram began? The whole purpose of Sayyidul Shahada going to Karbala was the one of Islah, was the one of reform. He himself says, وَإِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلِبِ الْإِصْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّتِي جَدِّي I've come out in order to seek reformation in the Ummah of my grandfather. Now me living all of these years later, remembering the event of Karbala, I too have a responsibility and that responsibility is the one of reformation. Reformation within and reformation externally as well. The first step of that reformation within is I look at myself and see what are those things that are stopping me from pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What are those habits of mine? What are those actions of mine that I do that stop me from getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the days of Muharram, the days of Aza are a perfect opportunity because we're receiving constant reminders for some 40 plus days of the message of Imam Hussein, of the difficulties that Imam Hussein went through, of all the difficulties that Sayyidah Zainab and Imam Sajjad went through in order for this religion to reach us now that me and you sitting in our homes, crying, listening to this message, so that it could reach us in that same way that the Imam had intended it. They went through all of these difficulties for reformation, for a change within society, for a change within the Mu'mineen. If I haven't changed one iota, I haven't changed my life, I haven't made myself a better Muslim, I haven't made myself a better Shia, then I've to some extent wasted my time. Yes, crying for Aba Abdullah wipes away the sins. But those sins will accumulate again and I won't progress. So I come in Muharram, I cry for him, I have my sins wiped. But then I go back to my normal life. And I begin to accumulate those sins until the next Muharram. And then again I cry and have them wiped away until the net and then go back to the same sinning 
And then the next one, I'm not progressing. I'm staying exactly where I am. Islah, revolution, change, reformation is about progressing, is about developing. So I need to ask myself that where was I at the start of Muharram and where am I now? And what is it that I've changed in my life for the better? And if I haven't, I still have an opportunity to sit down and analyze my life and think, what is it that I can change? The days of COVID-19 had us stuck inside and many of us are still stuck inside. It gave us an opportunity to reflect on ourselves. It was a tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an opportunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An opportunity which sieved out all of those that were anti-azar, anti-majlis, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, okay, look, here's your opportunity. You were never happy about the majlis, you were never happy about the azadari, I've given you a perfect excuse to stay at home. But those that had the love for Sayyidul Shuhada, those that had the love for mourning for Imam Hussein, those that wanted to get closer to Allah through that mourning, they turned their homes into azakhanas. They turned their homes into places of majalis that the angels were descending to their homes. Those that wanted an excuse found their excuse, but those that were staunch found a way. Even if it was to gather around the TV and watch a majlis online, they found a way. So now that I've found that way to carry on this azadari, I need to find a way to reform myself. Everyone has something that they can improve within their life. One thing at a time. COVID-19 has given me an opportunity to sit at home and reflect on my life. And many took that opportunity to do more courses, to you know, top up their professional knowledge. Others squandered that time passing it on streaming things on Netflix or scrolling through their phone or constantly updating Facebook and taking selfies for their Instagram. And then there were a group that actually grabbed this opportunity to develop their inner self, their spiritual self, in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I said yesterday that Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam, their purpose was to take us towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so going with that theme, I have selected for the next three days a hadith from Imam al-Sajjad. The hadith is very lengthy. Um, we won't be able to cover all parts of it. But inshallah we'll look at three parts that uh, of that hadith that the Imam uh, refers to. Within this hadith that is narrated by uh, Abu Khalid al-Kabuli, Imam alayhi salam explains the different types of sin that bring upon a person a different type of bala, a different type of situation. So he'll have uh, this one part of the hadith will say, الذَّنُوبَ الَّتِي تَرَدُّ الدُّعَى the dhunub, the sins that one commits that pushes away dua, or the sins that one commits that changes his blessings, or the sins that one commits that will bring about bala, that will tear away the curtains that surround him. Various things that the Imam refers to. And much of it, um, we refer to it in Dua Kumail, you know, the start of Dua Kumail, where we're saying, Allahumma ghfil liya dhanuba allati tahbisu dua, or taqta'ur raja, you know, those sins of mine that take away, uh, that stop my dua from reaching you, those sins of mine that tear open the curtains that have hidden my bad points from the people, those sins of mine that bring bala upon me. 
So in this hadith, Imam explains certain sins that have certain effects. And I've selected three portions from this hadith. Then inshallah, you, if you want to look into it more, then you can go online and try and find the whole hadith. So in this particular part, Khalid, uh, Abba Khalid al-Kabuli, he says, سَمِعْتُ زَيْنَ الْعَابِدِينَ عَلِي ibn al-Husayn عليه السلام I heard Zayn al-Abidin Ali ibn al-Husayn, Imam al-Sajjad say, الذنوب التي تعجل الفناء Those sins of mine, or those sins that bring a person's death nearer. There are certain sins that hasten a person's death, and there are certain good things that increase a person's life expectancy. So here Imam, in this portion of the hadith, he lists some five or six points where different sins that a person commits that will hasten their death, that will shorten their life expectancy. So the first one says, قَطِيْعَةُ rahim Cutting off family ties. The first thing that reduces the life of an individual is when he cuts off ties with his family members. I know of places that I have been where blood brothers do not speak to each other. Blood brothers don't speak to each other. I know of places where blood brothers live opposite the road from each other but haven't been to see each other in 30 years over some silly thing that happened 30 years ago. See, in another portion of this hadith when Imam speaks about those things that bring uh, regret in the life of a person, he again, he says, قَتِيَةُ rahim says, Cutting off your relations with your blood relatives will bring regret in the life of a person. Ask the one whose brother has died and he hadn't spoken to him for a year or 10 years or 20 years. What sort of regret he feels within his heart. It's become very easy now for us to cut off relations with our family members. But it is that thing that will reduce the life expectancy of an individual and one that establishes the sile rahim uh, sile rahim the one that establishes relationships with his family members strengthens them the benefits are huge the one that cuts them off his death comes early his rizq is reduced allah takes away the barakah from his life there's so many different effects that cutting of family relations has. On the flip side, those that establish, those that strengthen their family relations, various hadith that I'll just go through uh, in almost bullet, po uh, bullet uh, point format, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what the Ayyimma alayhim salam say says that creating family relations, strengthening them, will strengthen a person, will weaken their enemy, will increase in their risk, will increase in their physical wealth because risk, wealth forms part of risk. Risk is anything to do with health, life expectancy, all of that is risk. Says so increases his wealth, increases his lifespan purifies his action, his a'mal are purified when he strengthens relations with his blood relatives, perfects his akhlaq, protects the na'mah, the blessing that Allah has given him, and makes that individual beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these, and there's so many more, but I've just selected a few of the effects of strengthening family ties. But the one that doesn't, 
One of the effects that Imam Sajjad alayhi salam speaks about is that his life expectancy will be reduced. His death will come quickly. Then the second thing that the Imam alayhi salam speaks about that brings the death of an individual quickly says وَالْيَمِينُ الْفَاجِرَةِ giving false oaths and when we look at the other hadith that surround uh, false oaths you know, from Rasulullah for example says لَا, ي- لا أُنِيلُ رَحْمَتِي مَنْ تَعَرَّضَ لِلْإِيمَانِ كَاضِبَةِ says whosoever gives false testimony uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afwan, he says in uh, Hadith Qudsi that whoever gives false testimony using my name, so i.e. gives an oath by Allah and it turns out to be false, he will never enter my mercy. I'll make him mahroom, not marhum. In another narration, Rasulullah, he says, he says whoever gives a false oath and he knows he is lying, has gone to war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's gone to war with God himself. He says, oh, by Allah this happened, or oh, by Allah this happened. And there are some uh, parallels that we'll draw with our lives, but I just quickly want to run through uh, the last of these hadith. Another narration says, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْيَمِينِ الْفَاجِرَةِ says, stay away from giving false oaths, for it will empty a house of its inhabitants. And when we look at what the uh, scholars say about this, it says, not just reduce the number. It may not necessarily kill everyone in the house, you know, uh, to put it crudely, but it will increase in their poverty. It will take away the risk from their home. Uh, it will physically affect them as well with illnesses that make them die quickly for a person that gives false oaths. And we may think about saying, well, well I don't really give any false oaths in regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does, this doesn't really apply to me. All those times when I'm trying to prove a point, and you know, even giving these oaths by Allah that we do, is it's been highly, highly unrecommended. So the Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim says, Look, you don't need to say wallah for everything that you are doing. You know, you don't need to say, Oh, by Allah, you know, honestly, you know, wallahi, this happened. So just don't do it. And then the worst is the one that says, Wallahi, in order to prove a lie of his own. Person's gone to war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our culture, in the indo pak culture, everything that we try and prove, qasam se, qasam se, qasam se. I'm given a qasam over qasam. There's multiple things that we we do, and straight away I'm saying, you know, qasam by Allah, qasam on the Quran, you know. It's, it's become commonplace, it's just part of our language. But the Imams had advised against it, and especially those that are in the habit of doing it, and sometimes they slip out a lie, or, or they don't know that what they're saying is a lie or not. But in order to really reinforce their point, they bring down a qasam. Yeah, they drop a qasam. Now no one can do it. And it's got to the point where someone is saying qasam, they say, oh, it's probably lying. Not just the lay people, people that get on the member. You know, in our khitab at, at times, in, in, the, in the style of speaking, in order to get people riled up in the, uh, in, at least in the Urdu language, you know, people are there, they're reciting, they're speaking, and they're, they're doing all of that with such fervor that they're saying, you know, by Allah, I read this, by Allah, the Imam said this. Well, so in, in Urdu, those of you that know Urdu will know that you know, th- there are certain ways that khutaba say things that they're making, they're taking a shari qasam. Khuda ki qasam, you know, Imam Hussain ne or different, different things that people say. They take a shari qasam. It reduces a person's life. So you have to be really careful in, in our speeches. 
in what we say in our conversations. Let it not be the case that I'm saying something, attributing something wrong to Allah, to the Imams, and in order to drive home my point, I want to throw in a qasam or an oath there. Now that seals the debate. So the second thing that reduces a person's life is giving false oaths. Well, aqwalu al and lying. Third thing that Imam al-Sajjad says that reduces the life of a person is lying. And we spoke briefly about lying yesterday. There's hadith from the Holy Prophet. He says, وَيْنٌ لِلَّذِي يُحَدِّثُ فَيَكْذِبُ says, woe unto the one that is saying something to the people and is lying. For what? In order to make them laugh. It's telling a joke. and spicing up the story a little bit. And we're all guilty of this. That, you know, I, I witnessed something really funny or as a group of friends and now I'm retelling it to another group of friends and I just spice it up a little bit, put a bit of masala on it to make it more, you know, more tangible, more acceptable, more, more that the people will laugh. Stand-up comedians and things that we have with our culture. That's that's exactly how they make their living. By telling lies. So the Holy Prophet says, Woe unto that person that tells a lie in order to make the people laugh. Wailun la, wailun la. Woe unto him, woe unto him. It's not acceptable to even be telling a lie in, in jest. And sometimes those lies in jest are like, well, oh, you know, it's just a little lie. Even those lies, for example, like you say to someone, oh, you never guess what happened, I crashed my car, for example. So, oh, no way. Nah, I'm only joking. That is a sin. It's counted against you. So it's become so easy for us. And we see it now, you know, politicians, people at the top of a, of a, uh, a political system that are constantly spewing lies, half-truths. We have to be very careful. This is damaging to our souls. And not just us lying ourselves, but being in the company of liars. You know, in uh, Dua Abu Hamza Thumali, when Imam Sajjad alayhi salam speaks about uh, the different reasons for why Allah would push a person away from his door, most of them surround an individual in his actions and the company that he keeps. Says, my Lord, maybe you found me amongst the liars or to be amongst the people that lie. And so you you left me. Lying is that thing that it will push us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we do it with such ease. And some people are just you know chronic liars. They they're compulsive liars. Everything that they say, every other thing, you can never get a straight answer out of them. That is a disease of the soul. They need help. Telling the truth, the Holy Prophet says, he says, Iyaka, uh, he says, Alaykum bas Sidq. He says, I called you towards telling the truth. Why? فَإِنَّهُ بَابٌ مِنْ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ because telling the truth, the truth, is one of the doors from amongst the doors of Jannah. And I am telling you to stay away from telling lies. Why? Because it is a door to the doors of it. It is a door from amongst the doors of hell, of the fire. I said yesterday that you know lying is the key to many things. Imam al Askari says, a house that contains all wretchedness, its key is lying. 
when a person accustoms themselves to lying, it becomes very easy for them to do other sins. Someone comes to the Holy Prophet and he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, look, I want to become a Muslim. I accept everything. But, you know, I've got a condition. And many people would come to Rasulullah with conditions. You know, in, the, in early Islam, a tribe would come and say, look, we're ready to accept this religion of yours, but we're going to keep our idols. The Prophet said, look, we can't keep, you can't keep your idols. He said, okay, give us uh, one year with our idols, at least the big one. The Prophet says, no. Yeah, so there was this exact point where the Holy Prophet went, no, so we, can't, we can't bend the rules for you. So this individual comes to the Holy Prophet says, Ya Rasulullah, I want to become Muslim. I accept everything that you're doing, but I've got a condition. The Holy Prophet says, what is your condition? He says, I can't stop drinking. Yeah, I've got a problem. I'm addicted to alcohol. So, you know, I'll become Muslim, but... I can't, I can't uh, let go of the booze. Yeah. So Holy Prophet says, okay, that's fine. Become a Muslim. And you can carry on drinking. However, I've got a requirement from you as well. Says, yeah, anything. What is it? Holy Prophet says, just don't lie. Says, that's it. So yeah, obviously you're going to be doing all your wajibat and whatever you want to carry on drinking, but I have one thing that I will stop you from doing, and then you can carry on drinking, and that is, don't lie. So okay, great. So he goes off, and you know, really happy, and the companions, everyone's confused, like the Holy Prophet. What's he, what's he talking about? Anyway, a short while later, like some weeks or months later, this individual again comes towards Rasulullah. Holy Prophet says, how are you? He says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm good. How about your, your, your drinking? He says, Ya Rasulullah, I've stopped drinking. He says, huh? You were so adamant about keeping it. You know, so adamant about maintaining that drink. He says, yeah, but Ya Rasulullah, you put the stipulation down that I can't lie. He says, so what happened? He says, well, now that I couldn't lie, you know, my friends would tell me, come and pray, and I would be like, well, I can't lie that I've had alcohol, so I try and make some sort of excuse that, you know, it's not because I've had alcohol, but I can't. And he says, day after day, it became more and more difficult to hide the fact that I was drinking from these people so that they wouldn't look bad on me. Uh, uh, they wouldn't look bad at me. And so I couldn't lie either. So I just ran out of different, you know, excuses. Uh, I ran out of ways to hide from these people. So eventually I thought, you know what, it's so much easier if I just leave, if I just leave drinking. So you see that holding on, controlling the lie allowed this individual to give up something like drinking. And being able to control that vice made him control an even bigger vice or other vices within his life. So Imam al-Askari is saying that there is a house of wretchedness. Its key is lying. Imam al-Sajjad is saying that the one that accustoms himself to lying, one of the effects is that his life will be reduced. The fourth thing that the Imam alayhi salam says that which causes one's life to be reduced. He says what zina is zina, adultery. Having extramarital relations. And this is you know, more and more it's becoming commonplace within TV, within other places, within our society. That now, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, this person slipped up or this person, you know, it, the sin is being justified. You know, I wouldn't usually do it, I was just in a bad place and so I went and the sin is being justified, it's being normalized. And one that accustoms themselves to doing this zina, this adultery, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would reduce his life according to Imam al-Sajjad. You have to be careful.
Because at any time it can happen. No, shaitan is constantly working on an individual. And we're having, you know, at times people try and think, oh no, look, Islam, why is it so restrictive? Why can't I have a, a couple's date night? I'm, I'm going to go there. Why can't I have a couple's date night? We're the ones that receive the phone calls. The effects of these couples' date nights and couples' gatherings and things. It's happened. Then, oh, my marriage is broken up because, you know, my best friend or his wife. and Things we can't deny within our society. And at times, we stoke the fire. You no, know, remember yesterday's lecture, Imam, Imam al-Radha says, don't give a path to shaitan. Sometimes, you know, we're baiting shaitan. We're like, hey, let me see what you can do. I'm going to put myself in this situation and let's see what's happening. You have to be careful. I'm not saying that, you know, your date nights or whatever is haram and, you know, everyone's an adult and they can go and ask their marja and things. Oh, yeah, but everyone's in hijab. Yeah, that's, that's fine. But at the same time, one has to be aware. Because what we see as speakers, what we see uh, and speaking to uh, ulama and scholars, you know, the different types of issues that we get regarding people's marriage, regarding adultery. And when you look into it, a lot of the times, it's how oh, she was my best friend or he was my best friend and we were always getting together and I didn't realize that something was don't give shaitan a path the fifth thing that the imam says that will reduce the life expectancy of a person says وَصَدُّ طُرُقِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ says I'm blocking the path of the Muslimin. Now this one's a, a, an odd one. Where on the face of it, it's it's saying blocking the public path, causing issues for the Muslimin so that they have to go around you. you know, it's like sitting on a sidewalk, you know, and people are having to go around you. Imam says this reduces one's life expectancy. Everything yeah, it's a bit of an odd one, really, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sitting in the way and people have to pass no, you're doing dhulm on people so they're having to clamber over you to get past Allah says the effect of it is that your life expectancy will be reduced now when we look at the hadith which talks about uh, other hadith that talk about blocking the path you know, we have advices from Rasulullah, it says if you're going to dismount from your horse says, make sure you pull your horse to the side first and then come off your horse so you don't get in the way of other people that are trying to get by you. We look at our modern day lives and think, oh, you know what? I needed to get my family members off at home. So I pulled in the middle of the road outside my house. There was nowhere to park. Now, this may not happen so much in America because your roads are so huge, but you know, and you've all by and large got drives and reserved parking spaces. But here in England, you know, people are just free for all most of the places. So now I need to get there. So I'm going to stop my road, um, stop my car right in the middle of the road, get my family off. Now it doesn't matter how many people are waiting for me, uh, you know, behind, but I'm going to. And blocking the way. But we can say, okay, look, non-Muslim here, it says specifically Muslims. Come to our centers. I take my car and I say, you know what? My women folk are a'la, better than all the others. So I'm going to drive right to the door of the masjid. Blocking everyone that's coming. Huge line all the way outside. Why? Because I need to drop auntie off or mom off right here. Blocking the way. <laughs> there's, there's real life applications for this. It's blocking the way of the, of the Muslims. People come 
and they'll sit right at the entrance to the Husayniya or the Masjid. Inshallah, doesn't happen at Masjid Ali. They'll come and sit right at the door, you know, right by the door. The whole hall is empty, but they want to sit. That's their spot. They're going to sit there. And so now as the hall begins to fill up and the space is there, now someone who's coming after now has to climb over this person in order to get to the front. It's blocking the way, He's sitting right in the way. Brother, if you could just move, it'd be easier. No one dares go and uh, say this because they know this person is going to get really upset. That's his spot. He doesn't want to move from that spot. So sitting in the way, sitting in an awkward place where people have to clamber over you in the Husseini in the masjid. Well, Sajjad says it, it reduces one's life. And there is a point here as well, actually. Um, when you read the Tawzih al-Masail of uh, your Marjan, in the Bab where it talks about uh, Ghasbi of a place of Namaz, one of the, the places or one of the, uh, the subsections that are brought in is that uh, if a person is sitting in his place, so namaz has begun or uh, this generally happens in the larger nights during the amal. I've got my place, I'm sitting there or someone is sitting there in their place. They've come nice and early, they've got that. Now here comes Nabil, he's late as usual and he wants to be in the front row to, in order to you know, pray namaz on that night. You know, it's just before it's coming to Maghrib time. I need to be in the front row because I'll also catch the uh, uh, mal as well. So I clamber over everyone, making my way, get to the front row. See, there's no room. You know, everyone's looking at me going, look, there's no room. And I'm like, no, 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 no. There's room here. So I just step in between two people and, you know, sort of force them apart. Push them out of their place and I take my seat. In the Tawzi al-Masail, it says that this place is now ghasbi because it was someone's place. You force them, even if they, at times, they're happy on the outward, going, oh, yeah, yeah, brother, but inside, if they're still upset about you taking that space, that place is ghasbi. And on the basis of ihtiyati wajib, you need to move to somewhere else in the masjid and re-recite your namaz. Imagine. The real world applications. Blocking the path for the Muslimin is something that will shorten one's lifespan. And then the last thing that the Imam says is that following a false Imam, following the false Imam will reduce the lifespan of an individual. History has shown those that came and tried to be the Imam of the people and what their end was. And the hadith also tell us of a time that will come where people shall begin to claim to be the Imam. We have to be aware that in this time there are people that will come and claim to be the Imam, they'll claim to be the Yamani, they'll claim to be the Khurasani. It's a time of great confusion. More than anything, inshallah, none of us will come and claim to be the Imam, but you know, others that come, we need to be aware of. You know, what is it that we're we're doing? Are we are we astutely aware of the characteristics of an imam? Am I aware of various things? Or have I become blind? How you know, various cults are popping up, even in Iraq, with an individual who calls himself, you know, he started off as being the Yamani, and now other reports are coming out that now he's trying to say, I'm the son of Imam al Mahdi have to be aware of how the enemies are beginning to infiltrate in order to attack this concept of imama, this concept of Mahdawiyyah. So six things that Imam Sajjad salam says that will shorten the lifespan of the human being. The first is cutting family ties. Second is giving false oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third is lying Fourth is adultery. The fifth is blocking the way for the Muslimin. And the sixth is unjustly claiming to be an Imam. These six things. 
will hasten the death of an individual. Inshallah, if we can try and analyze our lives to see you know, how it is that we can better ourselves so that we're able to recognize our Imam. Karbala is filled with examples of the mutadayyineen, of those that were apparently God-fearing, but yet were unable to recognize their Imam. And they committed such atrocities, such atrocities, that at times were unable to relay everything that happened because of the sheer amount of tragedy during the event of Karbala of people being there on the land of Karbala all that that happened there and then following the event of following the day of Ashura towards Sham Gharibah what happened to the children of Abba Abdullah. On this night, I want to remember that four-year-old daughter of Abi Abdullah, the one that is known as Sakina, that constantly remembered her father, was constantly by the side of her father. And on the day of Ashura, when Abba Abdullah comes to bid farewell, she comes running towards Abi Abdullah. Abata, istaslamta lil maut. Father, have you, have you submitted yourself to death? Abba Abdullah looks towards her. He says, my daughter, what else can I do? What else can the one that has no friends and no helpers do? He gives her to Sayyidah Zainab. Says Zainab, take care of her, for she is dear to me. I often think when reciting the Masaib of this young daughter of Abba Abdullah, that what Masaib shall I recite? What Musiba of hers shall I recite? Four years is her age. But yet the musibah she saw, no child should ever have to see. Do I speak about her thirst? That alongside all of the other children, she too was thirsty? She will have seen all her loved ones die one by one. Shami Gariban, when the water is brought, the narrations say that they went to give her water. Instead, she ran towards where the tents used to be. They say to her, Sakina, where are you going? She calls back saying, you said the youngest must drink first. My brother Ali Asghar is still thirsty. Or along the way to Sham. Through Kufa, whenever water would be brought, the narrations don't say she drank, but they say that she would run towards her brother Sayyid Sajjad and pour the water on his chains, saying that the heat of the desert is heating the chains of my brother Sajjad and I'm pouring this water to cool them down. Or at times when the army would stop, Shemar would be pouring water for his army. She would look towards him, ask him for some water. He turned to her, he said, that you want this water? She said, I'm thirsty. He takes the water, he gives it to all of his army. He looks back towards her and says, are you still thirsty? She says, yes. He pours the water on the ground. This daughter of Abi Abdullah ran towards that wet earth and laid herself in the heat of the desert on that wet earth. What masaib of this girl should I recite? That girl that went from Karbala to Kufa, from Kufa to Sham, wearing a burnt cloth on her body a burnt shirt 
that when they set fire to the tents, she ran from one tent to another. Hamid ibn Muslim says, I saw a young girl come out, her clothes on fire. I came towards her. She said, he said, I don't want to hurt you. Let me just put out the fire. He said, I put out the fire. She looked towards me, said, oh, Sheikh, you have been so good to me by putting out this fire. Do one other ihsan upon me says what is it says show me the way to Najaf says child what is there in Najaf says I want to go and complain to my father about Abdul, uh, my uh, my grandfather Amirul Mu'mineen about what they did to my father about Abdullah do I recite the masaib of her injured ears that her earrings were pulled from her ears what masaib of this daughter of Aba Abdullah do I recite? The masaib of Sham? Where she was almost sold into slavery? Or the night when she sees her father in her dream? She wakes up crying. Says, oh, where is my father? Auntie, where is my father? I just saw my father. They're trying to tell her, Sakina, you had a dream. Sakina, it was a dream. Your father's not here. Sakina, go back to sleep. No, she carried on crying. I want my father. All of the women gathered around. They began crying. They informed Yazid. They said, there is a commotion in the prison. What happened? Says that the daughter of Hussein saw her father in her dream. She's begun crying. All of the women are crying. Yazid turns towards them, says, give her the head of Hussein. This wasn't an act of mercy from Yazid. This was one other way of increasing the dhulm upon Ali Muhammad. That trauma, increase their trauma, send the severed head of her father towards her. They bring the head of Abu Abdullah in a tray, covered with a cloth. They bring it towards her. She turns to her auntie Zainab. Oh, auntie, I don't want to eat. I want my father. They pull away the cloth. She sees the severed head of her father on the tray. She runs towards it. Abata, Abata, father, oh father. She takes the head of her father. Abata, man alladhi aytamani ala sighir sinni. Father, tell me who orphaned me at such a young age. Abata man alladhi qata'a waridayk. Father, tell me who cut the veins of your neck. Abata, father, tell me who covered your face in your beard, in your blood. Abata laytani kuntu amya wa lam ara ra'asaka hakadha. Father, how I wish I was blind on this day that I would not have seen your head in such a state. They say she laid down. She placed her lips on the lips of her father. She began telling him of all the difficulties and all the trials that they had to face. Father, whenever we would cry for you, they would slap us. Father, whenever we would fall behind, they would slap us. Father, no one was slept more than our auntie Zainab because every time they wanted to slap us Zainab would stand in the way and say do not slap the children of Abba Abdullah slap Zainab instead she carries on talking until a voice is heard Ilayya, Ilayya, fa'ana oh my daughter come to me come to me for I'm waiting for you the girl falls silent Sajjad goes towards his sister. He sees the head of Abba Abdullah on one side. He sees his sister on the other. He goes to wake his sister. He cries out, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Oh, Auntie Zainab, come, my sister Sakina is no more. Ala la'anatullah ala al-qawm al-zalimin. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون 
We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the sins of our parents. O oh Allah, those of our parents that are alive, give them long lives. Those of our parents that have left this world, give them a place next to Ali Muhammad in Jannah. O oh Allah, those who are ill, give them shifa'ah. Those who are in debt, clear their debts. O oh Allah, keep safe the Shia of Ali Muhammad around the world. O oh Allah, give us the opportunity to go on the ziyarat of Aba Abdullah and the Aimma this year and every year. Ya Allah, keep safe the Zaireen of Sayyid al Shahda. Ya Allah, keep safe our ulama and our maraja and keep them at the head of our institutions. Ya Allah, hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time and allow us to be amongst his true mutadilin, his true waiters, for the acceptance of these du'as and any other du'as that your brothers and sisters have brought on this night. Please recite, wherever in the world you may be, the loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah, Assalamu alayka ya Ibn Rasulullah.